of Kate screaming outside. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to a pleasant Sunday evening in quiet, normally quiet Hoy Lake. Just happens to be a child outside playing in the sand and screaming at the top of its very, very lungs. So we're going to do a live Q&A. I've had a bunch of questions over in the community section of my channel where I asked yesterday if anybody had any questions. And then the top voted ones will be answered. And they're going to be answered now. So the most topest voted one is by Mr. Skyler. What does being mentally healthy look like in a sick society? Thanks for all that you do. Not really sure how to answer this without going on a long rant about uh, the pitfalls and the weaknesses of psychology. I won't do that. I won't go into a long rant. I will say that psychology, which so psychology is what determines whether an individual is mentally healthy, not sociology, not anthropology, not evolutionary biology. It's psychology largely that determines who is mentally healthy. But it has long been a criticism of psychology, which is relatively young as a, a separate discipline from philosophy, which it was originally. Psychology departments grow historically out of philosophy departments. It was a branch of philosophy. And in my humble opinion, it would do better to stop the pretense of science and to go back to its philosophical roots. That's just my opinion. Um, it's always been a controversial issue from the outset uh, because you can't extract the individual from the culture in any meaningful way because we are mammals, we're pack mammals, we're tribal um, collective creatures in our biology, in our DNA, and you just can't escape from that. So it raises sort of controversial issues around the meaning of mental sickness and mental health, mental ill health. You know, it's not revolutionary. It's not mind-breakingly controversial issues, but somewhat controversial, controversial issues. Who, who gets to say if somebody's mentally healthy? And uh, what would it mean if somebody was well adapted to a sick society? Then wouldn't that mean that they are, in fact, mentally unhealthy, but socially acceptable? And where's the discrete boundary between socially acceptable patterns and boundaries of belief and behavior and our notion of mental wellness? Or are they synonymous? Is somebody essentially mentally well if they go along and are compliant and agreeable? and essentially mentally ill if they don't go along and are not agreeable. There is a psychiatrist, psychotherapist. No, I'm pretty sure he's a psychiatrist. Let's have a little look. Psychiatrist. Um, and his name was Lang, and he wrote about this. A Scottish psychiatrist who wrote extensively on mental illness. Uh, born in 1927, when uh, passed away sadly in 1989, R.D. Lang, L-A-I-N-G. Um, and one of his uh, points was about the nature of psychiatry and the nature of psychology and what it means when we say that somebody is mentally ill. Lang, a psychiatrist, was seen as an important figure in the anti-psychiatry movement along with David Cooper, although he never denied the value of treating mental illness. He also challenged psychiatric diagnosis itself, arguing that diagnosis of a mental disorder contradicted accepted medical procedure. Diagnosis was made on the basis of behavior or conduct and examination and ancillary tests that traditionally precede the diagnosis of viable pathologies like broken bones or pneumonia occurred after the diagnosis of mental disorder, if at all. Hence, according to Lang, Michael says, isn't she a singer? That's Katie Lang. Katie Lang, Constant Craving. Great track from the 90s. No, not Katie Lang, R.D. Lang. Uh, Lang maintained that schizophrenia was a theory, not a fact. Uh, he believed the models of genetically inherited schizophrenia being promoted by biologically based psychiatry were not accepted by leading medical ge geneticists. He rejected the medical mo model of mental illness. According to Lang, diagnosis of mental illness did not follow a traditional medical model, and this led to him... This led him to question the use of medication, such as antipsychotics by psychiatry. 
His attitude to recreational drugs was quite different. Privately, he advocated an anarchy, an anarchy of experience, this decadent, disgusting hippie. Lang, in the politics of experience, if the human race survives, future men will, I suspect, look back on our enlightened epoch as a veritable age of darkness. They will presumably be able to savor the irony of the situation with more amusement than we can extract from it. The laughs on us. They will see what we call what we call schizophrenia was one of the forms in which, often through quite ordinary people, the light began to break through the cracks in our all too closed minds. I don't see it that way. I, I don't see it the way Lang sees it, but I'm not a psychiatrist. Um, I have a degree in psychology. I'm quoting a psychiatrist who was anti-diagnostic uh, and the medical model of psychiatry so that you guys and girls and people and human entities can see for yourselves that there is a controversy uh, inside of psychology and psychiatry around this issue. Who determines who is mentally healthy? Who determines who is mentally sick? What is the discrete line between um, obedience uh, and agreeableness and just conformity and everybody just stating, oh, that person is mentally healthy? And where can that go wrong? So I just want to um, very quickly talk to you a little bit about where it can and has gone wrong, even in very, very recent history. Hopefully I will find it here. The political abuse of psychiatry in the Soviet Union. There was a sy systematic political abuse of psychiatry in the Soviet Union based on the interpretation of political opposition or dissent as a psychiatric problem. It was called psychopathological mechanisms of dissent. During the leadership of General Secretary Leonid Brezhnev, psychiatry was used to disable and remove from society political opponents, dissidents, who openly expressed beliefs that contradicted the official dogma. The term philosophical intoxication, for instance, was widely applied to the mental disorders diagnosed when people disagreed with the country's communist leaders. And by referring to the writings of the founding fathers of Marxism, Leninism, Karl Marx, Friedrich Engels and Vladimir Lenin, made them the target of criticism. So we can see a totalitarian state can very quickly misuse psychiatry because of the way it's set up, because we really don't know. We really don't know who to say who's mentally well, and we can't easily distinguish the boundary between this, saying this person is mentally well, or they're just conforming and going along with what the collective wants, and this person is mentally unwell, or they're simply non-conformist. It's very, very hard for us to determine. Back to philosophy. If you want my personal opinion as a, as a you know, somebody who's worked, in psychology and around therapy and around psychotherapists for since I graduated with a degree was it 1999 like 20 23 years um, I, what I would say uh, uh, personally on the issue is we have useful models we have useful models for when people are in desperate pain for when people are really desperately struggling, most of the models of psychotherapy, I'm not a big fan of, of medicine, I'm not a big fan of the medical models, but when it comes to psychotherapy and counseling, if people are in desperate, desperate pain, these models can and often do alleviate that desperate pain. If you have a good counselor, if you have a good psychotherapist, if there is rapport and trust and understanding and they are skilled and they are experienced, good can be done. As a methodology for understanding who, who or whomst isn't uh, ill mentally, it's appalling. I mean, there's just no, it's dreadful. It's, I mean, it, quite frankly, it's fraudulent. That by the strictest definitions of fraudulence, it's fraudulent. Uh, it's, I think it's quackery. Let me just check what quackery means. I think a quack is somebody who pretends to be a doctor but isn't. Let me just check that quackery dishonest practices and claims to having special knowledge and skill in some field typically medicine okay not just field not just uh, medicine but any field it's quackery you're claiming to know something about human beings that, that, that you don't know this is not me being edgy and rebellious and you know fringe this is 
known. This is known, Khaleesi. It's it's a known thing. Like we don't we don't know who's we don't know. We say mental sick. They're mentally sick. They have a mental illness. And you go, oh, it's an illness. Who deals with illness? Doctors deal with illness. They're mentally sick. Oh, they have a sickness. Is it a virus? Is it a bacteria? Do you test the urine? Is there a neurotransmitter test? Is that no, no? These are uh, the thick end of the wedge of the diagnoses come uh, through conversation, in which um, I don't know if you're aware of this, but um, people can lie. A, a, a lie is where the person doesn't tell the truth. They don't report honestly what their experience is. So that is a bit of a problem because people who you would determine to be non-conformist and potentially diagnosable as mentally unwell might be somewhat antisocial. They might be reaction seeking and they might engage in this terrible, terrible practice of deception through the gob, through the mouth hole called lying. And so they don't, they don't always report to you exactly what their experience is, but you're relying naively. One is relying, a psychologist, the field of psychology is relying on honest reports from somebody who might benefit from telling the truth. Secondly, by their very nature of saying that they're mentally ill, presumably they're cognitively confused. So presumably they're emotionally dysregulated. The boundary they're just riding choppers now. They're just riding choppers around here now, just to disrupt my, this is, this is a personal attack on me. It's the CIA has sent them. Where am I, where am I, my paranoid ideas of, uh, where am I? Oh yeah, so, so we, we, we really don't know. There's no way of knowing. There is just no way of knowing whether this is a, a, a medical condition or not. And we probably shouldn't talk that way. It probably isn't particularly useful to talk that way. Back to the question, that Skylar asked, what does being mentally healthy look like in a sick society? Um, I can't really in good faith answer the question without qualifying it by saying, I don't really know what, I don't know what mental health is. I don't know what mental sickness is in its essence um, as it is determined external to me by other, by other people. Different psychotherapists and counselors could have very different opinions about what mental health looks like. We could talk in broad terms about being maladaptive or adaptive. So you're either in pain and suffering due to your emotions and due to your, uh, um, your, emotion, your emotional dysregulation and your cognitive ability to, I don't know, successfully perform reality tests, for, for an example, or to um, successfully build bonds with other human being, beings. Uh, to successfully maintain your personal hygiene, to clothe yourself, to feed yourself free from aid, uh, to successfully have the impulse control not to commit crimes. I mean, and you might say, oh, this is, um, you know, you're using uh, extreme examples to make a point. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. Historically, mental illness was associated with criminality, 100%. If you go back and you look at the source of the word psychopath, the, obviously, it's gone through this, the psychopath, sociopath debate. There's different schools, biological, genetic, environmental. Okay, fine. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about history and etymology. Psychopath, the way it was used historically, was to describe criminals. Uh, um, if you read the writing, if you go back to like the asylums of the 18th century and you read what the doctors and, and um, then call them therapists, physicians, what the physicians were writing about the mentally and emotionally disturbed, presumably PTSD, uh, traumatized people in their care, they would describe them as being morally insane, morally insane. So you go, oh, oh so moral judgments about personal conduct are baked into the cake. Yes, historically they are, and they've never been eradicated. What does it mean to be morally insane? You know, to, to, <laughs> let's, let's, let's get our feet dirty. Uh, a, 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 a man comes and he won't stop stealing. And you say, stop stealing or we'll cut off one of your fingers or brand you on the forehead. And he doesn't stop. And you say, stop stealing or we'll hang you by the neck until you be dead, diddly dead. Or we will, I don't know, send you to a penal colony. We'll send you to, to Tasmania. And he simply doesn't stop stealing. 
there's a class issue here. There's an education issue here where you say you and I, whether we're the pompous, well-fed, well-educated gentleman in an asylum in Paris or London or Berlin. And we look and we say, what is wrong with this moral degenerate? He won't bloody stop stealing. Well, his mother was a, you know, a prostitute or what would you even say that? You'd say like a woman of the night and he's one of 10 illegitimate children. Five of his brothers died in violent deaths, you know, and on and on. It's, a, it's, a, it's like a class thing. It's a frustration. You just go, what is what this person is? They're morally insane. They don't have a morality. Why would, because I would turn to you and say, well, why wouldn't you do this, Albert? And you'd say, well, I wouldn't do it because by God, my conscience wouldn't permit me to do it. And then you turn to me and say, why wouldn't you do it, George? And I go, well, yeah, by God, I have a moral duty in my Christian belief system to not behave this way because I fear the day of judgment. Okay, so why do these people not fear the day of judgment? Because they're morally insane. Why do they not fear uh, the consequences of their actions here on earth? Because they're morally insane. There were people in those times who were addicted, who, you know, where the child mortality rate was so high, where life itself was so brutal and violent, especially in the, uh, in the big cities. Um, you know, drug addiction, prostitution, alcohol addiction, People coming back from wars with head injuries who had undiagnosed, undiagnosable PTSD, uh, uh, traumatic brain injuries. And they just couldn't, or oh, they, they I say they couldn't stop. I don't know. Maybe they needed help. Maybe they needed more assistance and it just didn't exist for them. So they were violent. They beat people to death and arguments over card games. Or you had a woman who just wouldn't stop selling herself to keep taking gin. And you'd be like, that woman is you know, she's morally insane. These people, these poor souls who ended up in asylums, who were then treated in the most barbaric ways you can imagine, they would be uh, tumbled inside of giant spinning machines, not making it up. Um, they would literally put them inside of a human sized washing machine and then turn it thinking that because they had spun into moral insanity, perhaps you could spin them back into sanity. Uh, they would be starved, uh, fasted. They would be given uh, enemas forcibly against their will. They would be dunked in freezing cold water to see if the, you know, the demons of their moral insanity could be taken out of them that way. They were tortured, effectively. They were imprisoned and tortured, not always, but. I mean, some of the conditions in asylums over the years have been something akin to the Spanish Inquisition on a bad day, right up the way till the 40s. If you're sensitive, just mute me for 30 seconds. In America, there was a psychiatrist in the 40s, right the way, sorry, up until the late 40s. Mute me if you're sensitive. Mute me. He would cut off women's breasts. He would remove their cervixes. He took out men's teeth in the name of medicine, because in the, up until the 40s, this doctor, this utter lunatic, sadistic quack, claimed that uh, the insanity lived in the teeth, or it lived in the womb, or it was, it was physically located in the breast. You can come back now if you're squeamish. So I, I think um, I concern myself with maps. I concern myself with the, with the, very deeply with the, uh, the framing of an issue because an ill-framed issue, an ill-asked question can lead to barbaric um, results. And the whole notion of, of mental illness, I wouldn't say the notion of mental illness is barbaric, um, but, but, but yeah, it, it's a poor framing. It's just a bad frame. It's a bad frame. It's not all um, Freud's fault. I mean, he was, yes, he was a, a physician, a neurologist, and he did a lot to medicalize psychology, but there were other people long before him who were medicalizing psychology. I mean, it was standard practice to send the morally insane. We, we think of the old, like you think of Arkham Asylum and Batman or any, anything where you think of an old asylum, you think they're talking mental illness. They were bridged. They were bridged to the period of time very closely and very culturally to simply believing people were possessed by demons. 
and wanting to beat the evil out of people, shake the evil out of people, terrify the evil out of people. So I'm not making this up about cold water dousing, human washing machines, uh, forced enemas, forced fasting, um, you're right the way through to electroshock uh, uh, treatment. There was this sense, it's a super, in my humble opinion, a superstitious sense that the person is effectively possessed by evil, by, sorry, by uh, moral insanity, which is, as I say, and I will say again, that is the origin of the word psychopath. And we've never lost that, in my humble opinion. The shadowing, the echo, the karma of these old asylums and that term psychopath to describe the criminally insane, we still live with today. Look at, look at the word psychopath now. Our notion of psychopathy, you wanna know where it comes from? It's a, in, in terms of not all psychiatry and psychological terminology comes from one place geographically and historically. Psychopathy as we know it today has a location and a, and a time period. It is America, it is the American penal system, and it is the 60s, 70s, and 80s. So largely speaking, if you look at the thick end of the wedge of the research and the exploration around psychopathy, it's American. It's an American notion. When we say American psychopath, uh, like, like American Psycho, the book, it really is an American idea. I'm not saying Americans are psychopaths or it's a purely American. I'm not, I'm not saying the psychopathy is, is owned by America. It isn't. There are psychopaths all over the world, if you accept the, the term. But our notion should be understood as coming from the American penal system. And before that, it came from old school asylums, man, where you would put people who, yes, they were criminals, but perhaps out of sort of sense of Christian charity, you wouldn't just put them in like a hard jail. So you'd be presented, I don't know, here's, here's Mary and his, um, I don't know, Audrey, I'm trying to think of older names, and they've both uh, stabbed, they're both uh, gin swilling prostitutes who both stabbed a man to death. Mary appears cold and hard, and she says, I did it because I hated him and I'm glad he's dead. Audrey doesn't seem to know what planet she's on. She doesn't know what day of the week it is. She doesn't know where she is. She babbles, she talks as a child sometimes, and then, uh, then another time she will speak as though she's an old man. She strips herself naked, smothers herself in poo and runs around the place. These are real cases that were like this. So imagine the night, not, let's not say naivety, but imagine, how much more we know now that they didn't know then as a physician in that time. And you and I, well-meaning, let's assume good faith. There were good faith physicians, there were good faith uh, psychologists, uh, neurologists. And we look at the two cases, one, you're more likely as a human being making a subjective judgment call based on your morals that you're a Christian in Europe in that time. And you go, this one is evil and did evil knowingly send her to the judge. She will probably either be sent to a penal colony or, or, or hanged or, or whatever, whatever the punishment is. This one, though, needs help. Let's put her in the human washing machine and then dab her in cold water. <laughs> I shouldn't <laughs> laugh. Terrible things happen to human beings for a very, very long time. So what does being mentally healthy look like in a sick society? I, I mean, you know, the short answer to this question is there is no meaningful model of mental health in a thoroughly sick society. I think that's the easiest answer. It, the, the notion itself is barbaric. Oh, sorry. The notion itself of mental illness and mental sickness is a misappropriation of a medical model that, that doesn't belong there that has led to barbarism. And I'm surprised that of all the extremely intelligent people over the world who worked in this field, None of them could see that coming. None of them could see the Soviet misuse of, you know, to think of just one example of the, of the barbaric misuse of these models, the Soviet misuse of psychiatry. Nobody could see that coming. I mean, it's, it's obvious. You have a non-existent illness that is quackery. Well, you know, if it, if it means, if I say you've got it, if I have the power as a, as a medical doctor who's trained as a psychiatrist and I have the power to say, I don't care what you say, I know better than you do. And if you have the invisible boogeyman, you go to prison and we might, 
you know, torture you there or chop parts off you or just give you a really, really hard time there. Of the power is open to abuse. So it's, of course, it's going to lead to abuse. Of course, it's going to lead to exploitation and barbarism. So, um, uh, uh, perhaps a more useful answer to your question now we've done like the, the philosophical premise would be, you know, the, presumably here you are suggesting that we live in a sick society. I agree with you. What does it look like to be mentally healthy? I can't, I can't issue um, an answer that is broad scale, use, useful for everybody, that's politically correct, that is um, safe. I can't do that. I can't, I can't do that. I can tell you how I deal with it personally. I look for the source. You, you said we live in a sick society, and I know what you mean. I look for the source of the sickness, and I see it as being one of uh, propaganda and ideological infection cultural weight, cultural karma. We have a whole wave, just like a human being, an individual, so it is with a society, so it is with collective. All the garbage and crap and nonsense and stupidity of the past has its own karmic weight and rushes forward like a wave. And if we don't fight against it actively, daily, hourly, uh, we will be swept away by it. So you must fight, you have to fight. You have to fight for your personal boundaries. You have to fight for your agency. You have to fight for your um, sovereignty or you'll be, you'll be washed away with this stuff. And I see it as the number one danger that we face in the, in the, you know, the Western liberal democracies, ha ha, that we, that we live in now is, is ideological infection. Um, and we can see where it's leading. We, we can see the, how deep the rot is. So, um, in many ways, a lot of the time, if I can paint in broad brushstrokes, you should go against a lot, if not most, of what you're being fed to do. It is not for you. It is for the collective. Now, remember what I said at the beginning. If I give that advice in a non-nuanced way, I will effectively be uh, encouraging people to do a thing collectively, even though this is a small collective of people who watch me on YouTube, uh, to act in a way that is highly likely, for reasons I explained earlier in this talk, to get them diagnosed as mentally sick. Because if you're non-conformist, you're moving against what, what the cultural norms are, you're, you're highly likely to be diagnosed as mentally sick. And this is coming, this is uh, our past is our future, this is coming again. The um, diagnosis of people who are dissidents, non-conformists, who are non-compliant and disagreeable as being mentally ill is, is, is here, pretty much, I mean, we already saw a little bit of it in the last two years. Do as you are told, and if you won't do as you're told, you will be diagnosed as mentally ill. And the consequences of that is you will be quarantined and segregated from your fellow man, fellow woman, from your fellow human beings and put in a place where your sick ideological infection cannot be spread. This is coming if it is not here already. Uh, I think I've answered that question. I will now answer another question. Thank you, uh, Skyler. I enjoyed tackling it. Leslie has asked the question and it got voted up. Unfortunately, Leslie, the, the answer to this question is going to be a lot shorter and slightly boring, but deal with me as I try to make it as fun, as interesting as I can. Leslie asks, in the emotional literacy course, you say, air quotes, I am not my emotions. I do. I do say that. So, asks Leslie, how then do we integrate that idea with how discovering the nuances of our emotions enables us to uncover our authentic core selves? People love this question. It got voted up. It is a good question. As I warned you, the answer is disappointingly simple. You are not your emotions, but your emotions can help you to discover uh, the, the nuance of your emotions helps you to uh, uncover and discover your authentic core self because your emotions are your messengers. Your emotions are your messengers. That's all they are. They are messengers. They are feedback in an intelligent system that is highly developed over a long, long time to help you move away from danger and move towards that which is good for you. For the overwhelming majority of us in our sick culture, we have switched it off. We've been told to switch, sorry, we have not been told. Um, due to certain, 
due to certain trends observable in cultural conditioning, my claim would be, in my humble opinion, that people have been moved away from understanding their own emotions to a nuance and to be highly emotionally literate, to becoming more and more emotionally illiterate because it makes them more obedient and it makes them better consumers. Let me be clear before you think I'm getting my tinfoil hat out. There is a sliding scale of intentionality. Sometimes this has been completely deliberate, totally conscious, totally deliberate. That's not a conspiracy theory. We all watch Century of the Self by Adam Curtis. We all know about uh, Edward Bernays as one example of a trend that was set in public relations and marketing to move us from buying products that we needed to buying products that we wanted. You might not think that's that big of a deal. I think it fundamentally fractured human consciousness in a way that made us emotionally illiterate because that type of consumerism necessitates emotional illiteracy. Because if you are not emotionally numb and you're emotionally literate, you will be a poor consumer. A consumer who is good by the standards of people who want to market to you is a consumer who has low impulse control, is dissatisfied, is somewhat angry, somewhat cranky, somewhat constipated, somewhat sexually frustrated, cannot sleep, cannot poop, cannot dance, cannot smile, cannot eat, is disassociated from the people around them, alienated from themselves, alienated from their families, alienated from nature, alienated from the earth, and generally a bit of a miserable TWAT. That is the perfect consumer. I can sell them anything. They're in so much pain. They're so miserable, so frustrated, so agitated, so bombarded, so worn out, worn down and frustrated that I can come along and tell them anything. And in their ultra submissive state of learned helplessness, they will obey me. They will vote the way I want them to vote and they will buy the Yeezys I want them to buy or whatever the child labor produced crapola overpriced is that I want them to buy. You couldn't have a culture and a society and an economy that runs today without broad scale, brutally harsh brainwashing. We have a lot of things and we're constantly being told that life is wonderful. We've never been more free. We've never had more things. We've definitely had never had more things. We've never had so much access to calories. We've never had such great air conditioning and so many channels. But I would say this for those of you who are crippled by guilt, you should do something about being crippled by guilt, by the way. You should listen to Nietzsche. Don't be crippled by guilt. You have also never been so propagandized to. You've never had less mental, psychological, and emotional privacy at any time in history than you do now. Your propagandizing, your uh, hypnosis is pretty much uh, every hour that you're awake. This is provable. This is not conspiracy theory. There's never been so much advertising. There's never been so much marketing. There's never been so much manufactured consent to use the Noam Chomsky concept. There's never been so much ideological infection to use the Zizek concept and to use the concept that's being uh, popularized and developed by Gad Saad. There is so much ideological infection, so much propagandizing now. It's amazing our tiny little brains even have a moment to breathe. And so, we are emotionally illiterate and emotionally numb, traumatized by a sheer weight of information that we are not evolved to deal with. We are a very poor evolutionary match for those of you who are fans of the Dark Horse podcast uh, run by the um, by Brett and Heather um, uh, Weinstein. It's a good podcast that they're often talking about uh, issues of the day in relation to whether it's a good evolutionary match. Our culture is a dreadful evolutionary match for us. We should spend more time with each other, less time on devices, less time in front of screens and more time outside. And that would cure a whole host of mental, so-called, so-called mental illnesses. Because it's just a good evolutionary match. What happens when you put a tiger in a zoo? Do, are they really happy? Do they, do they grow to their full size? Do their teeth grow properly? Are they proud and strong and energetic? Or do they show signs of anxiety and depression? What is the animal that doesn't even grow its dorsal fin properly? It grows a floppy dorsal fin. It's a cetacean. It's not a dolphin. It was in the documentary Blackfish. Is it a killer whale? 
in captivity. I think this killer whales, they don't even grow uh, a, a proper uh, dorsal fin. It flops. It's flopping. What a sad documentary that was. I cried a lot in that documentary. That's us. That's us. We are meant to be free and we're imprisoned. They couldn't even move, these poor fuckers. Couldn't even turn around. And then they start killing the humans who are feeding them. And everybody goes, why would they do that? God, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe because you're psychologically and physically torturing them every day for hours on end and they live in hell. So you are not your emotions. Your emotions are your messengers. Um, you asked, how do we integrate the idea that our emotions are not us with how discovering the nuances of our emotions enables us to uncover our authentic core selves? Go where your emotions lead you. Don't have um, low impulse control. Have good impulse control. Have good discipline. Don't respond emotionally to things in life. Don't be an emotional wreck. Do all you can to re-regulate yourself physically, remembering that PTSD and complex PTSD is a physical problem as much, if not more so, than it is a psychological problem. Rely on rational thought. Sharpen your critical thinking skills and then pursue from that place of calm and boundaries and sanity, the nuance of your emotions and observe them with Zen-like detachment. What is this emotion? It isn't just that you're sad. It is something else. And it is a message. It is a message for you that has a positive intent. That's how I view my emotions. What is this? What am I feeling? Where is it trying to lead me towards? What's it trying to take me away from? Why is it talking to me? If you are ideologically infected, you'll think, oh, I feel bad and I want to feel good 24 seven. Is there a pill or a wank or a drink or a something that takes this feeling away? And then you just want to get back to being numb and smiley. That's sick. That's really sick. That's really perverse. The idea that your emotions aren't valid, they're you. It's like, uh, what is it? The foot binding practice. We're going to break our feet and walk around with bound feet now. It's insane. It's you. You're talking. You are talking to you. That's your emotions are talking to you. And you're saying, no, I don't, I don't want to listen to that. I can't, I can't hear that. Okay. Okay. Good luck. Good luck. When you start developing anxiety and you can't sleep and you're extremely anxious for no reason whatsoever, when you become obsessed with odd things in your life, your brain starts desperately seeking to disassociate from the torture of emotional illiteracy and the torture of your daily life. And you find yourself obsessing over things, tiny things, pointless things, desperately trying to escape the pain of this reality. When you are incredibly depressed, when there is no joy, you don't want to listen to any music, you don't sleep properly, you don't enjoy being around people, the music you used to love, you don't listen to anymore, you can't laugh, you can't dance. You can't have sex. You're impotent or disinterested in sex completely because you're so thoroughly depressed. Now, that is the animal that you are finally starting to breaking down after years of you crushing your emotions, of you being encouraged to dissociate and cut off your emotions. You will be sick. I have warned you for years that you will be sick. But people don't want to look at their emotions. What can I do? I'm one man. I'm not your dad. What am I going to do? Okay, next question. Let's see. We've got a big, big, big chunky vote. This is democracy. I am only reading the comments that have many, many votes. Okay, this one is from VMM. How to deal emotionally with bullying. There's lots of official routes we can take, but dealing with it in our own heads is a different matter. I specifically mean bullying from coworkers, neighbors, etc. not bullying that happened in childhood. I don't really want you to deal with bullying inside your own head. If you know your Nietzsche, that is the beginning of slave morality. And that is a, sickness that will never heal and will destroy your life why are people bullying you deal with it outside your head what position are you in what is going wrong where you have more than one person bullying you and you have to put up with it 
to the point where you're saying, how can I just deal with it inside my own head? How can I just live with this? I don't know, you could tell them that they'll be punished in hell in the afterlife and you'll get a special six star room in heaven and God the Father finally steps in and gives you your just rewards, however you'll be dead. No, deal with it in this life. Deal with it outside your head. Who is bullying you? Why? Don't let people bully you. It's totally, totally unacceptable for one adult. Well, it's totally unacceptable for any human to do it to another. But imagine what you're saying is one adult is exploiting, insulting, and oppressing me, and I also am an adult. Well, do something about it. And you said official roots. Have you thought about headbutting them? Perhaps right in the face as hard as you can. That's a joke. Don't engage in violence. It's wrong. Um, I, I would rather that you dealt with it not officially and not inside your head, but outside your head. I would rather you developed into the type of person that nobody would think of bullying. I cannot abide bullies. Everything I do is, is to help people. Um, free themselves from being bullied. It always has been since the Street Fight Secrets days to now, to the self-defense training days, which is where this whole channel comes from. If you don't know me and you don't know my history, this channel is a development out of street self-defense. Don't let yourself be bullied. You know, if I was a friend of yours, I'd want to know who was doing it, how it was happening, and then I would train you to deal with that bully. You want to be unbulliable. You shouldn't have to live with it. You shouldn't have to come with me. Come to me and ask, how do I deal with it inside my head? Deal with it outside your head. You've got to stand up for yourself, ultimately. And if you're in a working um, environment where that's happening and you can't do anything about it, then you're going to have to get some agency in your life and move to another job. I mean, but that would be a terrible, terrible shame. I'd much rather that you could deal with it face on. Remember as well, nowadays, um, thankfully, it's not the 60s and 70s. You said the official route. Companies are pretty aware of this kind of thing. They're also pretty scared of getting bad reports about them written up on glassdoor.com or on the various social media websites. So you can use the official route. But I would rather you just challenge the person who's bullying you, just head on, just say, what's your problem? What is happening here? What is going on in this dynamic? Do you tell me? What, what, what do you want from me? What is this? What game are we playing here? And just have it openly addressed, simply addressed. You're a reasonable human being. You're behaving lawfully and you have a right to go about your lawful business of doing your job or living your life without being harassed without having people say snide or nasty comments to you. So approach it directly. What's the problem? What's the issue? Let's talk about this. What's your frustration? Why do you talk to me like that? What, 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 what's hurting you? You're like a lion with a thorn in its paw. Come to me as a brother. Come to me as a friend. And perhaps I can help you. Perhaps I can take this thorn out of your paw. You're obviously upset about something. Is it something I'm doing? Did I offend you in some way? In a previous life, maybe? Why didn't you tell me? This is one route. I recommend it. It's better than the other routes and you'll feel better about yourself as well. Uh, we'll do one more of the, um, the, the most highly voted questions. Oh, that's got 18 votes. That's got 19 votes. Oh, I'm glad you know democracy must speak, my comrades. Sia asks, how do we deal with the lonesomeness of this journey? I don't know. What is your journey? Why are you doing it on your own? <laughs> how do we retain the hope that deep and meaningful companionship is possible? Um, okay. Where are the others? Question mark, question mark. It feels like a Twilight Zone episode where a library opens, but the spectacles break, or a beautiful woman awakens to find everyone with the faces of swine. It's just very poetic. <laughs> Is that positively psychedelic? It feels like a Twilight Zone episode where a library opens, 
but the spectacles break. I don't know what that means. Or a beautiful woman awakens to find everyone with the faces of swine. I'm not, I'm not following any of that. Um, you know, when I was a kid, I grew up in Portugal and they couldn't afford the Portuguese networks wanted to show English speaking TV shows and they couldn't always afford like the most modern ones. I was living there in the eighties. So they would buy old American TV shows, like old black and white detective shows, uh, old black and white cowboy shows. So I grew up watching The Rifleman and I grew up watching the old Twilight Zone. So I grew up watching the TV shows in the end of somebody who was like, who would be about 90 years old today. It's really weird. It was a real weird uh, American cultural indoctrination growing up in Portugal in the, uh, in the 80s. And they would have old English shows as well, like uh, Faulty Towers and Monty Python's Flying Circus and stuff. It was like from the 70s and 60s, really strange. Um, I, I, so I appreciate the Twilight Zone uh, uh, reference. Some of that stuff, even though it was low budget, and it was, I don't know when it was shot, it was the 50s and 60s. Some of it, some, just the ideas were so good. Uh, um, it was it was really disturbing. Some of the stuff was really, really disturbing. So let me go back to the beginning of your question, the, the bit that I did follow. How do we deal with the lonesomeness of this journey? I don't submit um, to the framing of the issue that, that you're on a journey that is nece necessarily lonesome. Um, I'm not just being contrarian. I will come back to the framing of the issue in a moment. Uh, how do we retain the hope that deep and meaningful companionship is possible? I will be honest with you, my friend. I don't, I, I don't know you, but um, because I've heard this kind of narrative before, I think a lot of people watching have their similar narrative and I wanna help as many people as possible. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say it like this. If, if we take an Alfred Adler perspective, if we take the Alfred Adler perspective, and we say that you're living a life lie, you're living a fictional narrative of your life, and that it is ultimately self-serving. What I would, if, if we were to do that, if you like Alfred Adler, I do. And um, I think far more useful, far more utilitarian than, than the, the Freud disappearing back up your mom and Jung going off into the stratosphere with symbols and magic and, and archetypes. Alfred Adler, much more forthright, much more functional. What do you gain from this story? What do you gain from this story that you're living? Why have you chosen to live this story? You know what I hear and feel and see intuitively when somebody speaks to me this way? Not just you, Shea. Uh, I'm saying Shea, it's Shea. It's gotta be Shea, right? Yeah, that's Shea. Uh, not just you, Shea, um, but other people. And I've, I've been guilty of it as well, is we've set up a paradigm where there's like a donkey with a, a, the, the stick and then the carrot on the end of the stick. And we fetishized the notion of friendship and companionship so much that is unbearable in the imperfect now. And so it becomes a carrot in the future that we sort of amble towards painfully whilst bemoaning the loneliness of our, as you said, journey. Don't do that. Don't do that. You're surrounded by people. Don't make them you said, where are the others? Yes, I, I know the Terence McKenna um, lecture you're talking about, but he did also say, find the others and don't make people, don't put people in boxes. Don't start looking at normal people. You know, I see online people talk about normies and thinking that they're not worth talking to or there's nothing there or they're, you know, even we should avoid um, you see it sometimes, not you, Shay, but other people, intellectual arrogance, spiritual arrogance. I'm awakened. I'm very clever. I've read the books. They haven't. So nothing here. This is the wrong way to approach life. Take the sustenance of human contact wherever it's offered and be grateful and be humble. Everybody's life is important to them. Everybody's life is significant to those they love and the people around them. Be kind, be open, be warm. You don't need to fetishize special magical circles of elf-like, holy, pure, beautiful soul friends that live on the planet Avatar. People are people and they're good enough just as they are. Connect with them, connect with them. They might not be into everything that you're into. They might not want to talk about CPTSD 
and Terence McKenna and the psychedelic experience for hours on end with you. That's okay. They might just want to talk about football and Home Depot and the last carpet they put in. But that's a person. That's a human being. And there's warmth there. And there's, there's a reason to talk to them. There's a reason to care. Don't, don't play the role of like, so you can play the wounded healer. You can be the lonely seeker of truth. You can be the, the you know, what was, oh, I always do this. Because I can never remember. There's some things that always go into like a memory hole for me. The main king in Lord of the Rings, when they win, what's his name? And what was he before he was king? Before he became, before he fought the demons of the apocalypse and became the wise old king, I think he was called Strider or Raider. He was Strider. And he used to run around in a hood with a bunch of cool swords and chop people up like a vigilante. And he was a lone wolf warrior. What a cool story to live. And then he goes and fights the, you know, the, the hordes of Urukai and defends the world of men and the world of elves and the world of dwarves and brings peace to the land. Great. What is the price of living a fantasy? What is the price of, a, of, of imposing a Tolkien-esque or, or, I don't know, whatever your favorite hero story is on yourself? What does it gain you? I don't know who your heroes are. Like, I'm not talking to you specifically now, Shay. I'm talking to everybody. But everybody has a hero narrative. And everybody has the idea that they're on a hero's journey. And it, it's good, you know, it can bring a lot of um, comfort in hard times. It's like a, a warm blanket you can wrap around yourself when, when times are tough. And so there's, there's benefit to that. But there's also cost. What is it costing you? Like, if you need to be strider, well, then you're on your own. If you need to be rolling this chain from the Dark Tower series, then you're on your own. There's a lot of heroic archetypes that have to be on their own. I would say don't, they never arrive. Roland, um, what is it, the line? Child, child Roland to the Dark Tower came. In all of the Stephen King book of the Dark Tower series, Roland never arrives. He doesn't want to. In the Adlerian sense, in the Adler's worldview, and, and it's, it's, exa it's exactly an Adlerian model, Roland is doing exactly what he wants to do. And you say, what? He, 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 he lurks, he lopes across the wasteland on his own, meeting various people who become sort of allies for a period, fighting giant lobsters, fighting, that's, that's, that's part of the story, fighting demonic trains and this and that. That's what he wants to do? That's what he wants to do. That's, that's him happy. Under all that pain and all that loneliness and all that duress and all that aggression and fighting and starvation and cold and living out in the world, that's Roland's doing what he wants to do. He loves it. He loves that. He loves playing that role. It is satisfying to him. We should never, uh, if you don't know Roland from the Dark Tower series, it's worth a look up. Because you know, there's different archetypes. Tolkien is, is one thing. And then there's, I was thinking, like, what's another mythology? It's a good one. Look up the Dark Tower series and look up the character of Roland. This Clint Eastwood man with no name, you know, all American uh, cowboy type dude. Um, this righteous knight who just goes across the land, the lone samurai, the Ronin, the Japanese have it in the, um, the Toshiro Mifune films that inspired, you know, Fistful of Dollars, A Few Dollars and All the Good, the Bad and the Ugly. But they're really good. They're really cool. I love them. I love, we all love them. We love Toshiro Mifune. You know, looking all stinky with his samurai hair all out of, you know, all battered. He's not got his makeup on properly. He's not done his hair properly. And he just looks kind of, and he's got like a bit of a beard and he looks a bit messy. He looks like he needs a bath. But if anyone messes with him, he's fast with the sword, isn't he? And then he leaves. He doesn't have the responsibility and the weight and the pain and the burden of people holding him back. He's not slowed down. That lone wolf is lean. That lone wolf is fast. Do you like that? Okay, cool, man. Like it. Like it. I can't tell you how to live your life. I'm like, oh, my God, I don't know how to live my own. If you like it, then like it. But don't complain. Don't complain. It comes at cost. You can live a different story if you want to. But you, there's no, 
deep and meaningful companionship on your lonesome journey. You want to live a lonesome journey seeking the others for your deep and meaningful companionship. You'll be seeking a long time. This is people and your people. You're a person. Be humble, be grateful, connect. You want connection? Go ahead and connect. Connect with the postman. Connect with the old lady next door. Come connect with your boss. Connect with whatever. The people who are right there, that's your karma. That's your dharma. You think it's stupid. You think it's, um, I don't know, pedestrian or quotidian or parochial or boring or ugly or and your fancy is no Roland wouldn't do this or whoever your 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 hero is. But that's your life in this time and in this place. And that's enough. That's enough. That would be the way to view that. I love these questions, guys. They're fantastic. 55 minutes and 45 seconds. I'm going to take some questions in the chat. Anybody want to ask me a question, make it one sentence long, have it end in a question mark. Don't get grumpy with me if your question doesn't make sense and I misunderstand it. That's on you. Make it clear. Remember, I don't know you. I don't know your story. Make it as clear as possible and I will do my level best. Brian O'Shea says, my cat's breath smells of cat's food. This is Zen. That's the kind of Zen I can get behind. That is a Zen haiku. My cat's breath smells of cat's food. Do you journal? Not anymore. But if you need to, you should. It's very, very helpful if you need to do it. SVSFSR7108X3. What's the point? Um, the point is that is no point. The point is there is no point. That's why psychology's got a problem. It's like human consciousness is like a torch and it's a beam. It's very narrow and very goal focused. So if you look at something and it goes forward, it's good, but it can only see that spotlight of what it sees. What it can't do is the spotlight of human consciousness cannot shine on its own beam. That's not possible. Aragorn was the character. Aragorn was the character in the Lord of the Rings. Yes, that's right. That's right. Aragorn, you're right. You're right. You're right. I like that actor too. What is the best starting point to deal with the crushing pain of going no contact when we had to in order to survive? Um. Well, I would say if it's a crushing pain and it's, it's like really, really disruptive, you're going to need to choose at what point you would let that go on before you would um, seek the, health, uh, the, the help of a professional for some face-to-face -face counseling or psychotherapy if it's really, really bad. Uh, the way I generally would suggest people deal with the pain of going no contact is to remember why they are going no contact and to repeat it as though twere uh, uh, some sort of a litany like you need to know why you're doing this and you have to repeat it over and over again because parts of your body and your brain are going to be saying this pain will be over if I get back in contact with them if I speak to them again but you need to remember why you're not speaking to them and you need to remember to give up all hope with that person if you don't do that, if you don't despair and give up all hope with that person, you'll go through the cycle again and again and again. So remember why you're doing it and abandon all hope. Uh, Visceral is here. Visceral Gravitas is here. Please watch his YouTube channel. It's full of uh, fun and funky clips. What? Do you think of this? Let us see. The opposite of lying is arguing. Okay. Because arguing is the way to get closer to truth. Uh, 
arguing is a way to get closer to truth. I'm not sure that that means you can state arguing is the opposite. <laughs> like, I mean, you could argue in bad faith, so that wouldn't be. And a lot of arguments, like you've seen it, mate, um, a lot of arguments that happen are done in bad faith. And so they don't bring you closer to truth. All they do is bring you closer to, I don't know, resentment and, and, and conflict. Um, but I like the thought. I like where it's going. It's a good thought. Sorry for bumping the, the phone when I'm looking. Visual Gravitas follows up by saying, arguing can be done bad. Yes, it can. Karima asks, why do you think some people are not interested in, oops, why do you think some people are not interested in talking about things such as love or the universe or trauma and possibly even feel intimidated by such talks while others love diving deep? Um, because they're dumb. They're dumb and they ain't got nothing to say. I, 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 I don't know. Like for some people, they like there might be some truth in that. What I just said jokingly. Like if you didn't think you could hold your own in a deep conversation about these issues, you might respond by shutting the conversation down with contempt or mockery or by being rude or just checking out of it completely because you really haven't thought about it. So for some people it makes them anxious um, because they're emotionally illiterate. I think, I think for some people it's sort of, there's a sense in which they, they experience like an opening of a doorway to a place that they just don't want to go to. I think that can happen as well. It's an interesting question. UG Rose is here. Hi, UG. Looking after the chat, uh, which is good. Thank you. Diddly, diddly, dee. Diddly, diddly, dee. Okay. We're going to do this question. One more question, and I'm finishing because I'm very hungry indeed. Creaky Gate asks, how does one differentiate between being open and honest and oversharing? Um, I'm... Generally speaking, not an advocate of this thing, this this sort of thing of saying, be open, be honest, be vulnerable. I would say be boundaried and be careful and be respectful at all times. There isn't, and it depends, like, if, if I say to a group of people, say there's 20 people in a room, and I say, guys, just, just, you know what? The key to connecting with others is vulnerability. Be as open and honest as you can. There's 20 people going to interpret that 20 different ways. And they, some of them could go out and be absolutely obnoxious and rude. And people be like, what did you say that for? And they go, I'm just being honest and open. Some people will start oversharing. They'll be like, oh, this happened to me when I was a kid to the cashier at the, at the local shop. Why? Well, you said to be open and honest. I, you, you won't have heard me say it. I'm, I don't. Because I'm aware that there's from different training areas, from the martial arts world and the, the uh, PT world, from the personal the fitness world, there's things you can say that are true, that are interpreted by people in a way that that just they take it in a really really odd direction, and this is one of them. So you you won't have heard me sat there saying, "Hey guys, just as a general principle, just like be open, be honest." I'm more likely to say, as a general principle, be aware, be socially intelligent be boundaried and try to be polite and respectful because I think it induces the tendency for people to be polite and respectful with you back. So if you're polite, you're respectful, you're humble, you're kind, there's a very strong pull in the other human being to, to mirror that and to reciprocate it. So it's a good way of, it's not a guarantee, but it's a good way of getting that back. Um, and generally speaking, I would say, you know, choose carefully the person and the time and the place you have to have really invest it with somebody uh, before you start telling them stuff and if you feel compelled to tell them personal things about you ask yourself why do i need to journal do i need to feel heard do i need to go to a therapist i mean i've had people ask me quite people insist on instagram insist insist despite my every effort i'm rude i'm dismissive i'm contemptuous i'm joking i'm none of those things um, to stop them asking me for dating advice and, and the question of oversharing on dates and like when on which date should I tell them about my childhood trauma is a regular question that I've been getting for the last four years of me being on Instagram and I went never 
never, nobody asked you in a dating context, who told you in a dating context that that was necessary or good. If you end up in a relationship with somebody and you think like, you know, you're three, four months in and you can really see a future with them and you're like, okay, this person needs to know about some of the stuff that I've been through because it's going to come up in the relationship as we move forward in intimacy. That's a different thing. But dating, I don't like dating. It's not even a thing. It's not even a verb I particularly understand. I don't even really know what it is. Um, but I would say never in the dating sphere, never. So avoid oversharing would be my advice. Avoid oversharing. And if you really, really feel like you need to be heard, that sounds like... I'd be saying, okay, you, you need to hire a therapist. Hire an adult human being who you can get on with, who'll listen to you and journal. Um, but your friends, you know, people have their own problems, man. Just try and leave them alone as much as you can. It can really, and it, it can really create a very strange dynamic when, you, when you've done that with people. Beer 27 says, moon's over my hammy. Okay. Ted, some classic advice here. I'm not going to say that out loud so the people who are just listening to this will never get it. Uh, okay, last question. Do, 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 do. Roberta here with the emotional regulation exercises. This is what we'll finish on. Ladies and gents, there is a free course. Free, totally free. Nobody's going to ask you for any money or anything. Um, it's called the Fortress Mental Health Protection System. It is a YouTube channel. It has some of like, I don't know, 12, 15 different videos. There's tutorials. There's also audios there if you look in the more description bar. And written exercises there to do that will help you to become more emotionally regulated. If you have anxiety, depression, symptoms of uh, complex post-traumatic stress disorder, go there, do the exercises. It's all free. Just follow along. And it's explained in a way that is clear. It has no jargon. I don't even think I swear on that channel, which was a major, major effort for me. Um, and check it out and you will feel more emotionally regulated. And a lot of these issues will fall into place. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining me here tonight. I've appreciated it. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for following along. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your time and your attention. The two most precious resources you have that you've just spent with me. And I hope that it was fruitful and I look forward to speaking to you again soon. Cheers.